again, we have new, new people here. We always have new people who listen to us by, uh, v via the, the uh, internet or uh, DVD and things like that. So some, for some people, this is their first time um, maybe listening to a message. And so I'm always reminded to remind you all, the listener, about the purpose of the book of Acts. Like all 66 books of the Bible, the, the book of Acts has a specific purpose from God. It's not just in the Bible haphazardly. It's in the Bible by God through the prophets and, and where it's at for a reason. The book of Acts is a bridge between God's program with the nation of Israel and his program with the nations, the Gentiles. In order to understand how God can go from I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Lord says, Matthew 10, uh, Matthew 15, and other passages. Salvation is of the Jews, John chapter 4. You know, people bring up John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world, you know that's the most famous passage in Scripture. But yet one chapter later, as he deals with a Samaritan woman who was akin to the Jews, they had Jewish blood, they're the Samaritans. They're that, they're that other uh, uh, sheep of his fold, as it were, in the book of John. It's not the Gentiles, it's the Samaritans. He must need go to Samaria. He told the woman at the well, John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. So even in John 3, 16, the people who had God's heart, the apple of his eye, the people who mattered were the Jews, the circumcision. It's not until you come to the ministry and message of the Apostle Paul where God is not making a distinction between mankind, the circumcision and the uncircumcision, the Jews and the Gentiles, the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the rest of the nations. Now, since Paul's salvation and the dispensation of grace, God is dealing with individual Jewish people, individual other nations, people, Gentiles, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. If you don't understand that when you're reading Acts or any other book of the Bible, I can guarantee you, you don't understand your Bible. I've challenged people for years about that, and I've never met anyone who, who understood, who didn't understand Paul's ministry and the reason God saved him in Acts 9, who could understand the Bible. You can't. Without the book of Acts, you wouldn't know how God goes from dealing with one nation to all of a sudden the first book of Paul is Romans. Romans were the Gentiles who were in power in Israel, in the land. So to get there, Acts is the actions, the activities, the, of the apostles, the 12 apostles first to the nation of Israel, Acts 1 through 7. The salvation of Saul, Acts, Acts 1 through 7, 7 is when they committed the unpardonable sin, Saul, Saul and Stephen, the religious leaders of Israel. Acts chapter 9, Paul is saved. He's a Jew and Gentile in one body, a type of the body of Christ. He's sent out to the Gentiles. And yes, in his early ministry, because there's a diminishing of Israel, not only did they fall in Acts 7, but there's a diminishing over the course of the book of Acts Paul did have a ministry to provoke Israel. We saw this last time. But what God is doing today is has a grace message. Now, I thought about that. Why does God call it the grace message? Well, there are two types of things in the scriptures. There's the, there's the, the, the covenant program that God has with the nation of Israel. There's seed, Abraham's seed, Genesis 12. That one is based on just a promise uh, uh, that by Abraham's faith, Abe's faith, God will bless, he got all these covenants, and all the covenants are based on Abraham's faith to his seed, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the people of Israel. When we talk about what God is doing today, it's pure grace, pure grace, no covenants. There's no covenants that God made where he would bless Gentiles without the nation of Israel. It's through him and his seed, Christ, and the people of Israel that the Gentiles are blessed in the kingdom. But today, through the Pauline grace message, it's pure grace, just a free gift because God is gracious and he looks at you based on the merits of his son at Calvary. God gives you the free gift of eternal life, which is his righteousness, by faith alone and Christ alone, no works. That's the difference. These covenants had to, were based on, well, he added the, the law. The law was added. That was a performance-based acceptance, okay? And Israel is going to be under that law, not today in the dispensation of grace. He's not dealing with them. But once the rapture takes place and he goes back to dealing with the prophetic program, that's going to be the issue until the day of atonement in the kingdom where he deals with their sin and gives them the spirit. That's what the Christ, that's what Christ died, the new covenant death. He died for Israel. He shed his blood. But they won't get the fullness of it, the land, or excuse me, forgiveness of sins, the land, all the blessings until the kingdom. 
Until then, God is not dealing with them. Today, he's definitely not dealing with a nation of Israel. And if you don't understand, that's why Paul is in your Bible. The book of Acts shows the fall of Israel and diminishing of Israel. And God's salvation through Christ going to the Gentiles by faith. You want to understand your Bible. Look at Paul's last epistle. It's Philemon. The next thing you see after his 13th epistle, God goes to the book of what? Hebrews. It's right there. The Hebrews are, that's the people of Israel, their race and their language. And so God is going to deal with them. And that's rightly dividing God's word. When you're reading a book of the Bible where God is making a distinction between being a Jew and a Gentile, you know you're in Israel's program. You can learn it. We're t I'm teaching the book of Acts. I'm teaching the book of Hebrews on Thursday, but I don't teach it like it's for you. Today it's called Satan's devices. Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. Unfortunately, many saints are. One of my goals today is going to show you some of his devices. We've been looking at Satan's persecution and opposition. One of his devices is to allow the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, to go forth un unaltered. He doesn't mind if, if, if people are teaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yea, Genesis through Acts, Hebrews through Revelation, and even Paul's epistles. Do you know you can teach Pauline epistles and yet not know and understand and believe that Paul's your apostle? There's a guy that comes on the radio right before me. He said in his preaching that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, yet he doesn't listen to Paul. That, that blew me away. Because if he thought about what he said, you're a Gentile. That's what I told him. Why aren't you listening to Paul? But this guy, he goes way back into the Old Testament and tell you those are verses written to you and about you. He doesn't rightly divide. So that's where we're at in the book of Acts. Paul is going out and he's dealing with the Gentiles. The Jews amongst the Gentiles, we're in, we're in Thessalonica, Acts chapter 17, and then we're going to go to Berea. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse 6. Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. So Paul, he's there in Thessalonica. He goes into the synagogue of the Jews, and like the persecution comes from Satan, from the religious Jews, and from the unbelieving Gentiles, they attack Paul because he's preaching truth. You know, I thought about that. I said, you know, it's interesting. Satan didn't keep the Jews from meeting each week, each Sabbath day at the, at the synagogue. You would think he would fight against them even meeting, but he didn't. Why? Because God changed the program. Satan freely allowed these Jews to meet at the synagogue on every, sa every Sabbath day, and they, they, they got in the Old Testament. Let me show you why. I was just thinking about this. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians 3. I mean, let, me show, let me show you what's behind Satan. He, he will allow the word of God to be preached as long as it's not rightly divided. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. This is very important. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 is dealing with the difference between the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant God gave Israel... Because they're Jews in Corinth, okay? We're studying 1 Corinthians in, in the next session, not today. Brother, uh, first Sundays, Brother Josh is preach, preaches uh, Ephesians. But every, every other Sunday, we're here uh, in the second session, I'm teaching 1 Corinthians. There were many Jews in the body of Christ there at Corinth. And Paul, you can tell, he deals with a lot of Jewish issues in 1 and 2 Corinthians. One of the things was, what, Paul, what about the law? He does it in the book of Romans. He says, I speak to them that know the law. There were Jews at Rome. Paul didn't just, when he says I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, he means all nations, including Jewish people and other Gentiles. Well, look what happened here. He says in, in chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he calls, he calls the, the, the law he's dealing with. Uh, verse 6, he says, who also, speaking of God, hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Well, see, people say, well, see, Ron, there it is. We're, we're under the New Testament, but, but just keep reading. Not of the letter. It's not based upon that, that covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers when they, in the day that I grabbed them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. He goes from Israel and Judah to Israel. In that day, in those days, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit and, 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 and cause them to keep my ways. He's talking about the kingdom. The body of Christ is not part of the earthly kingdom on, uh, in, in Christ, that covenant. So Paul says, not of the letter, but of the spirit. 
We have the spirit of the grace that God has given. And the issue in, all, in both programs on, in the earth and in heaven is eternal life. That's what I want you to see. Everything is based on eternal life. Yea, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They get the Holy Spirit for eternal life, the day of atonement in the kingdom. We get it as believers today, the moment we trust Christ. Romans 5, 5, the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Ephesians 1, 13, he has given us the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the earnest of our inheritance in the heavenly places. See, the issue with eternal life is always the Spirit. Paul calls the Galatians the, the, the promise of the Spirit, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith of Jesus Christ. So just think eternal life. All the covenants. If he tells Abraham, you're going to live in the land forever. Abraham died. David died. All, the, all those guys died back there. Well, God is going to resurrect them and give them eternal life in the earthly kingdom. You and I get the spirit of grace. That's what he's talking about. The spirit of that eternal life now. He says in verse 6, who hath also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter. Paul wasn't ministering that new covenant to Israel. That's their covenant. By the way, if you're a covenant theologist out there, a theologian or whatever, the covenant always has to do with land. So if you're a part of that covenant, you're going to get some land in the earth. That's why that prayer of Jabez 10 years ago and all that was so big. Increase my, uh, uh, over there, he talks about, uh, um, you know, increase my land and all this. That was a, that's a prayer that only a Jew could pray. You know, how you increase your land is being faithful to the Pauline grace message so that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, he'll make you co-rule and co-reign in Christ over the heavenly places. There's land up there too. We just can't see it yet. So you don't need to be praying the prayer of Jabez to increase your land. That's a Jewish Israeli prayer. So look what he says. He says, verse, verse um, 6, not of the letter, but of the spirit for, further explanation, for the letter killeth but the Spirit giveth life. Can I show you something? Even, e as long as that Old Testament covenant, and in particular, that's what Paul is going to deal with, that thing's going to be in effect after the dispensation of grace is over. Until the kingdom, let me show you. From the rapture on to the kingdom when they get it, they're still going to have to endure to the end. And they're still under performance-based acceptance. God doesn't put you and I under performance-based acceptance. He said, the Spirit giveth life. We have life. Verse 7. Now watch what he calls the law. But if the ministration of life written in, huh? Death. death. You know, people want to put you under the law and under the Ten Commandments as a grace believer. Paul says, Romans 6, 14, we're not under the law. We're under grace. It's called the ministration of death. It was written and engraven in stones. That's the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Was glorious, but it was glorious. Paul says, Romans 7, the law is holy and just and good. Oh, yeah, it's God's word. But he calls it ministration of death. All it does is minister death to, un, uh, to, to humans because we're, we're, we're sinners. If that was glorious, verse 7, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. The second time Moses went up, the first time he went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, his face didn't shine. Interesting. He, Joshua was up. It, well, there's a lot there. He comes down, but before he even gives it to the people, he breaks it. Type of the first coming of Christ. Uh, the law was broken, and he had to die for the broken law. God's, God tells Moses to come back up later. Now, that second time, his face shone. That's a type of the law in the kingdom. They're still going to have God's law, but it's going to be glorious because they'll be able to keep it. It's a type of the second coming of Christ, as it were, when he gives Israel the kingdom. They're still going to have God's righteous law, but it'll be glory for them and not broken. Okay? First time broken, second time glory. But there's another thing there. Paul says there's another lesson in that for the children of Israel. They couldn't really look at it, okay? Let's, let's see why. Why? Because, verse 7, which glory was to be done away. Even when, when God gave them that law, it wasn't to be forever. It was a temporary covenant. For, when I say them, to keep it in their own strength, okay, without the Spirit. That's my point. 
So Israel was under that law. They couldn't keep it. It kept killing them. It sent them to cutting them off, sending them into hell. The ones who didn't believe God, they went just like the Gentiles cut off. Their soul was cut off. They're dying all the way through here. One day the believing remnant will get, get, get the spirit of God to help them keep it. And he'll cause them to keep it. Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? He's talking about what we have today. God's grace. This is the spirit of God in us working, okay? It's not our performance. Look at, look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation, another term for the law, condemnation. Look what he calls grace. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So we have a, a, a ministration of righteousness in the grace message. Look at the rest of that. Um, verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. When you compare law and grace, there's no comparison. Grace is better. Israel will get God's grace in the kingdom, but grace is better, okay? That's what he's saying. Verse, verse 11. For if that which is done away, he's talking about the law. We're studying the book of Hebrews on, on Thursday nights. You, should, you need to be with us because we're going to learn that the law, Christ is greater than the law. And, 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 and in the book of Hebrews, he says that law is ended. It waxeth old and decayeth. There's a, there's a diminishing of the law in the book of Hebrews because the temple is still up at that time and will be in the future. But look what he says. As far as God looks at it and in effects today, he says, verse 11, for if that which is done away, that's performance-based acceptance, that's the law, was glorious. Much more that which remaineth is glorious. That's the grace message. Now watch this. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Paul says, I can just go up there and preach the truth of God's word, rightly divided, make it nice and plain. See, to put believers under the law, you listen to people who teach, whether on TV and radio. To put grace believers under the law, they got to use wisdom of words and they got to they got to twist stuff and say, well, James really doesn't mean that you're justified by faith plus words. What he means is if you do believe, then you will do that. They, they haven't read the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The Corinthians were saints, believers, and they walked just like the lost Gentiles, worse than they did. So don't let them use all these, use great plainest speech, just leave verses where they're at. That's right division. That's what Paul is saying. Look what he says. Verse 12. Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. He's saying the way Moses put this veil on him, he was hiding some stuff. And not as Moses would put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Israel could not see fully the face of Moses when he, when he veiled himself. He had to veil himself because of the glory. He, when he went into the tabernacle, he took the veil off. He was with the Lord. With the, with the people, because of the glory of the Lord, he had to put a veil on. That, that's just showing that they didn't have the fullness of it. Well, look what he says. It is abolished, verse 13. But their minds were blinded. That's what I want you to see. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Listen to what he's saying. Satan will, will allow Jews to be in synagogues to this day. They're in synagogues, okay? They're over in the synagogues. They're reading the Old Testament. They did it in Paul's day. They got, they let, Satan let them do it. Today, Orthodox Jews over in Israel and other places are going there every Sabbath, which is our Saturday, and they're reading the Old Testament. But they're blinded to what it's speaking about because the Old Testament speaks about who? The Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. He said, search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Paul says, in his day and to our day, their minds are blinded in the reading of the Old Testament. So when Paul would go into these synagogues, these Jews would go about their little religion, reading the Old Testament, thinking that they're still the people of God, although the prophet says if they knew, if they looked around and saw that the Romans and all these Gentiles way back have been over them, the prophet says if they just think about the fact that Gentiles are reigning over them, they know they aren't in God's will. If you deal with a Jew today, say, the fact that I'm talking to you in Minnesota means you're out of the will of God. The Jews are supposed to be in the land. That's how the Antichrist is going to get them to come back, by the way. If, if, if you are a Jewish person right here in America, they're out of the will of God. They're to be in the land. See, 
it, it, the fact that they're dispersed is, is, is proof of God's dis, discontent with, with them, okay? And that's the point. Here's what I'm saying. They are blinded, verse 14. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Satan won't stop you from reading Scripture. He'll just stop you from two things. Don't read the Old Testament like I would read it or you would read it, rightly divided, particularly seeing Jesus Christ there, okay? That includes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by the way. That's Old Testament and Acts until you get to Paul. All that's Old Testament. They're still under the law. As people read that on Sundays today, there's churches all in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Sermon on the Mount, all that stuff, telling people today that these are written to you and about you. Satan will allow that. What Satan won't allow, just look around you. Look at these little pity people here. Every grace church I've ever been with, just a few people. We're, we're, we're not a lot, but we're out there. He'll fight this truth. Satan fights the gospel of grace. Uh, I mean, a clear gospel. People get mad at me because I say stuff like, uh, you don't have to give your heart to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, turn from your sins, repent of your sins, all these wisdom of words, because I tell them they need to trust Christ alone. When you get saved, then you turn from your sins. You can't turn from your sins as a, as a lost person. You're dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2. Don't add works or what Paul calls words of wisdom to the gospel. Just give them the cross. Just give them the cross and say, let him do all the saving. You do all the being saved. God will change you. Give God, let God do what God can do. You can't change yourself. So he fights that. He'll add works to that. But once you get saved, he'll keep you from knowing the mystery of Christ, the, the message that we preach here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, Romans 16, 25, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, what God is doing through the church, the body of Christ in the heavenly places. Churches won't teach you that. Paul says over in, in 2 Timothy, he says, ever learning, but never able to come into knowledge of the truth. They know the Bible, all the facts and figures. Chris and I were talking. Thursday nights we go home, and this Jewish guy on there, the one who got mad at me for preaching the book of Galatians because he's all into Moses, he said he know all about this old covenant stuff. I listen to him because I get some good stuff from him. He, I let him do all the work. and I, No, not all the work. I studied out, but he's all Jewish. He's all in this stuff. I'm learning a lot. Good. All that is is facts and figures and history. You can know all that and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the mystery of Christ. That's what Paul is saying. You can have all these years of the word of God, know, know the, 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 you can know all these facts about the Lord's earthly ministry. Just don't get to know Paul and his doctrine. That's what Satan wants to hide. That's what he's doing. So Paul would go into these synagogues where these Jews have their minds blinded as they read the Old Testament, and he would give them the truth of God's word. You know the first thing he did? He took the scroll, and he, pre he preached about Messiah. He didn't preach Jesus Christ yet. He says, okay, we're, we're, we're looking at the scrolls. The scrolls teach Messiah, so we know Messiah has to die. First of all, he has to be born at this place, okay, Beth Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. He has to be born of a virgin. He has to be born in this time schedule, according to Daniel. All these things, okay? And Paul says, there's only one man that fits these things, but I won't tell you about him yet. He had to die. He had to be buried. He had to be raised again. He had to die by crucifixion. And, and he's just building a case about Messiah. He'll say, hey, you know what? Jesus of Nazareth, he fulfilled that. He is Christ. And then he went on. And, that's, and as soon as Paul started giving that message, here comes Satan to fight him. That's what we're going to see. Look with me, if you will, before we go back to Acts. Let me show you a passage in 2 Corinthians 4. Do you understand why Paul says, watch out for wisdom of words? Because smart guys, real intellectual guys, not that you can't, there's some good, smart, grace preachers. Brother Alex Kerr is very intellectual, but he, he knows the grace message. But not many are intellectual. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, not many wise men after the flesh, real smart guys. Because what they'll start to do They'll, they'll, get, they'll get into the human viewpoint, and they want to they show you something deep from it, and it won't be what Paul did. So watch out for that. Watch how Paul says it. Verse, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, and what that ministry is, um, I didn't finish the passage in chapter 3, but as, until the, the, the nation of Israel's heart turns to the Lord. Now, unfortunately, 
It's going to happen just like it always happens. I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I get calls from people and emails daily about pro problems and troubles. There's something called the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming on the scene. We know it as the tribulation period, the great tribulation period. It's the seventh, 70th week of Daniel, okay? It's going to be some fire, probably nuclear warfare between the uh, Muslims and the Jews. It's going to take that trouble to get them to believe God. That's what I'm saying. You do that with your children. Your children really don't want to listen to you because they're rebellious. They're born with a rebellious spirit. It's until daddy has to, or at least the threat of the, that's when they, you know, that's what's going to happen. Israel won't turn to the Lord until they say, Jesus, if you're God, you just, somebody help us. Now, the first thing, they're going to turn into the Antichrist, but the believing remnant, because the Spirit of God will be at work, going to have them turn. But I'm saying, there's going to have to be, they're going to have to go through some punishment, man. Unfortunately, I tell people, they get to the end of their rope, then they come to the Lord. That's just life most, for most people, okay? Look what he says here. It says, when they turn to the Lord at the end of chapter uh, 3. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, talking about the, the grace ministry, as we have received mercy, mercy is a special favor from the Lord in particular here. Two, two types of mercy. There's the mercy not giving you what you deserve, but Paul says the Lord have mercy on the house of Onesiphorus. There's a special, uh, for, as Paul writes to preachers, Timothy, Titus, and those guys, Instead of just saying grace and peace, he'll, he'll say grace, mercy, and peace. And I studied that out, and, and, and I, it, it, it seems as if Paul is asking God for special favor for those who are faithful to Paul. Because he'll always say that for those who set their heart for, for, for blessing Paul and his message. In other words, those who labor diligently, this guy, he sought him out diligently while he was at Rome. And God give him mercy in that day. This guy had already died, but he says, give it to his household and at the judgment seat of Christ, Lord. Just because he believed your word through me entirely through his life, give him a special, it's a special reward. So that's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about here. We receive mercy, this wonderful ministry. We faint not because it's the ministry of God's grace. But we have, verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things of what? Dishonesty. People are dishonesty with, dishonest with God's word. When you're teaching the Bible, I want you to understand this. I'm going to say it clear. When you're I get up. Krista, Krista laughs at me. I get up and I listen to the, the TV as I'm getting dressed in the morning just so that my, my heart could be burning to get this truth out. Here and when, you're dishonest when you're teaching the book and you're not rightly dividing the book. That's the truth. You're being dishonest. You're cheating people. You're cheating God out of his glory through the mystery of Christ. You're cheating people out of understanding God's word. That's, he says, Paul says, we who rightly divide the scriptures, that's what he's talking about, the grace message, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. There's a whole ministry where it's just craftiness. Craftiness means sleight of hand. They, they use wisdom of words and good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of simple. This is their entire ministry. Watch this. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. See, there it is. But by manifestation of the what? Truth. All of God's word is truth, but you need to rightly divide the word of truth. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says, you can look at what I'm saying. It's right there. I left James says what he say. I say what I say. It, it, they contradict, but you know why. Watch what he says in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, that's the gospel of grace in the, in the preaching of Christ, according to the mystery. It is hid to them that are what? Lost. In whom? So in these lost people, the God of this world, that's Satan. This is one of his devices. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Now, now, let's stop right there. Satan blinds their mind, but they allow him to do it. It, it. Satan can't just override your will as much as God won't override your will. But what he can do is he'll do it this way. This is how he gets you. This is one of his devices. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which, what's those next two words? Believe not. Satan can't keep you from hearing God's word nor believing God's word if you want God's word. You get that? There are people here, like myself and you all, who do see the word and hear the word rightly divided and understand it or, or are in it. 
So obviously he can't keep it. If he could, nobody would know it. But God has chosen to, to, to give it to those who believe the word of God rightly divided. If you believe it, you'll get it. Satan can't stop you. And then he says, lest the light, verse 4, of the glorious gospel of Christ, the resurrected Christ, death, burial, resurrection, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay? Go back to the book of Acts, if you will, Acts 17. So when Paul goes into these synagogues, He gets to preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw last time the Jews, verse 5, look at verse 5, but the Jews which believe not. See that? He's blinded the minds of them which believe not. So the Jews, the religious people who, are, who got the word of God, they're reading the word of God, studying the Old Testament, but they don't believe the truth. They, don't, they haven't advanced in truth about Messiah. They believe not. We saw that they, they move within reverse 5. They took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, foolish men, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Notice Satan used, we saw last time, he used religion and politics to, to, to try to thwart the grace message. That's what he do, and he, do, he does it today. Religion and politics killed the Lord Jesus. I didn't say faith and government. I said religion and politics. They killed the Lord. They killed Steve. They'll kill. They'll try to destroy the message is the point. Verse, but look at verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Um, let me, as, as, we, as we come towards the end of our study, let me show you how they did it. The way they turned the world upside down, shook things up, wasn't by being riotous or unruly. Not at all. We're to be, as the Lord tells his, his, his disciples during his earthly ministry, we're to be as wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Paul says in Philippians 2, we're to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without uh, rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. We're to be meek. But being meek doesn't mean you just shush up or you can't say that's wrong, you can't disagree. You just respectfully say, I'm going to tell you what the word of God, because he says holding forth the word of life. Let me show you. It was the word of God that made these things all crazy in that land, and it'll, it'll, it's some power in the word. Look at chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, look at verse 5. Acts chapter 24 and verse 5. Everywhere Paul went, Satan riled up the religious men and the lost heathen Gentiles, and boy, they, they gave it to the apostle. Paul had a, part of that was Paul had a special suffering as well. None of us are really going to get it, and I've never known anyone to get it the way Paul did, not even in other countries. He had a, I'll show him what great things he must suffer for my sake, Acts chapter 9, 16. He had a special suffering, because he persecuted the little flock, so he was getting back what he had sold, okay? Plus, he was an apostle, and there was a whole bunch of things there. But I want you to see something. Look at Acts chapter 25, 24 and verse 5. Paul, he goes to another place. They all mad at him again. Look at verse 5. For we have found this man a, what type of fellow? Pest, pestilent fellow. You know what a pestilent fellow is? You ever see a pest? A pest is like uh, mice and roaches, whatever little animals you call a you call Orkin in and come get this day. He's messing with me. They saw Paul that way. He was just getting under their skin. Not doing anything but preaching truth. That's all. That's all. That's all. He was a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. You see these goofs? They just making stuff up. Sedition against the Roman Empire. That's why they were trying to do that means you were going against. He wasn't going against the Roman Empire. He just said, there's a greater than the Roman Empire, a greater king than Caesar. His name is Jesus. Some Jews believed, some didn't, okay? So it wasn't throughout the whole world. Paul had not even gotten to Rome yet and all his other stuff, so, you know, whatever. And a ringleader of the sect of the, what? Nazarenes. What, what that is, when we get there, they, they called the people, the, excuse me, the Jews called the other Jews who believed on Jesus as their Messiah of the sect of the Nazarenes, okay, Jesus of Nazareth. That's why they call him that. So I want you to see everywhere Paul went, they were accusing him of doing all this uh, sedition and all this other stuff, going against Rome. They were just making up stuff, making up stuff. Go with me. 
as we conclude, I want to I show you this is going th throughout the Bible. We're going to go in the Old Testament and see when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, he had his prophets, they accused his prophets of doing the same thing. So before we end, let's look at a few verses and then we'll end. Uh, look at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. <clears throat> 1 Kings 18. You all know Elijah. You all know the prophet Elijah. You know, the, you know there was a guy named King Ahab. A guy who let his wife run him and got Israel in trouble. You know the woman Jezebel. Got him to commit murder. Got him to, 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 to steal another man, another Israelite man, uh, man's property against the law. Kind of like what they were doing with Jason. And it was his wife who says, you go and do it. You're king. I'll take care of him. And they had him killed. And all this stuff. But Elijah got a word for this guy. 1 Kings 18, verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. So, so Elijah goes and get his man the word of the Lord, as a prophet would do. And it came to pass, in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Look, he didn't even let him get onto him. He just saw him coming. Here we go. Art thou he that troubleth who? Israel. He's going to say, you're causing all this trouble, Elijah. Now, what did Elijah cause trouble? He didn't do nothing but speak God's word faithfully. That's how you cause trouble, okay? Look here, verse 18. I love Elijah. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. He says, I'm not the problem, king. You are. I am faithful to the Lord God of Israel. You and your fathers have broken his commandments. You're the one who trusts. Israel was in trouble because their kings were going against God's word, okay? Now, you had your faithful remnant there. In Elijah day, there were 7,000 men who hadn't bowed their knee to Baal, but most of them were prophets of Baal, led by Israel's king, Ahab, and his, his Jezebel, okay, his wife Jezebel. Uh, go with me over to Jeremiah 38. Same thing happened to Jeremiah. It happened to all the prophets, but I'm just showing you uh, particulars. Go over to the book of Jeremiah, if you will. Jeremiah chapter 38. Somebody asked me when they listen to radio, I said, Brother Ron, boy, do you just stay in Paul's epistles? I say, yeah, for 13 minutes on the air, I got to. Nobody else but Les Feldick is telling you about this. When you come to the assembly, we all th I'm teaching out of Israel's books. I'm just rightly divided. Jeremiah chapter 38, look at verse 2. Jeremiah 38, verse 2, thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword. So Jeremiah is, is calling down, he's telling, he's warning about the wrath of God is going to come by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He says, watch this, thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans, that's, Nebu that's the Babylonians, shall live. For he shall have his life for a prey and shall live. Jeremiah says, y'all better get ready. Here come old Nebi. And it will be to your advantage to just go along with him. Because if you're here fighting, he's going to destroy you. That's what he's saying. But you know what? The religious leaders of Israel didn't want to listen to that. They're leaders. Watch verse 3. Uh, what did I say? 30? Yep, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore, the princes said unto the king, okay, so Jeremiah gives the prophecy. The princes of Israel, they have, they have a little uh, council session with the king. They say, now you hear that prophet, you hear that so-called prophet Jeremiah, the troubler? What you think about that? He's saying all these bad things. We're the people of God. That, God forbid that happened to us. Watch what happens. Verse 4, therefore, the princes said unto the king, we beseech thee, let this man be, be believed no, be bled to death. I mean, there's the prophet who, who both killed their prophets. Be put, let them be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of men of war that remain in the city. I bet he did. They're getting an army ready, they think, to fight Nebuchadnezzar. The prophet is saying, thus saith the Lord, don't fight. Go. Submit. You'll die if you fight. And he's saying that word from Jeremiah is, is weakening the, the resolve of our, of our uh, soldiers. Okay? Look what he says. Verse 4, that remaineth in the city and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them, for this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Now you see that lie? Jeremiah loved his, 
Jeremiah loved his nation. He didn't want that to happen, but he says, y'all been breaking God's commands. According to Leviticus 26, he says this is going to happen. He already let the Assyrians get you up there, the, the, the tribes of uh, the ten tri northern tribes. Uh, Nebi got them, and they're going to get them down here in Judea, in Judea, okay? And that's how they ended up in captivity over there in Babylon for 70 years. Go over to Amos chapter 7 as we come down to the end. Amos 7. These are books you probably won't get into for a while. That's fine. You know, We have to, Amos, we have to uh, get into Paul's epistles. We have to major in Paul, but I'll take you over here as well. Amos chapter number 7, look at verse 10. Amos 7 and verse 10. Amos, another prophet to Israel. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, <laughs> So one of these priests, he, he hears the prophet saying these things, okay? He goes, I need to tell the king, this joker is out here saying bad things about the king and our nation and, and, here, and, and saying bad things. Watch this. I love this. I mean, to me, it's hilarious. Saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel, and the land is not able to do what? Bear all his words. You get that? All Amos was doing was speaking the word of the Lord, and these guys are trembling because they said, we can't let him speak that. He's, the land can't bear it. We got our own way we want to do things, and God keeps messing with our plans. And I'm tired of these prophets saying that God keeps saying this because we really know that. They didn't know nothing. You see that? They couldn't bear. The land could not bear the words. Keep reading. Verse 11. For thus Amos saith. Jeroboam shall die by the sword. I guarantee you that that king, when he heard that, he was like, oh, Lord, man, what happened? You mean to tell me he's saying I'm going to die? Yep, God said it. He's going to die by the sword, verse 11. And Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah son, said unto Amos, O thou seer, seer is another name for prophet, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. You know what he's saying? Get out of here. We don't want you here. Go and prophesy somewhere else. Verse 13. But prophesy not anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and is the king's court. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I love this. He goes, you think this is of me? He says, I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son. He says, there are no prophets in my family's line. Basically, he's going to say, I was just a herdsman out there. I'm doing my thing. God came to me. Watch this. He says, I, I'm not no prophet, verse 14. Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, go prophesy unto my people Israel. The guy says, look, man, I'm doing this because God told me to do it. I didn't choose. I, I was fine being a farmer. But God sent me. Verse 16. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not unto Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. He's saying, you all don't want me to say this stuff against you, but I got to go with what God says. Verse 17, therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. See that? As we come down to the end, what's going on is, in every generation, even today, people don't want to hear God's word. They want smooth things. They got itching ears, Paul says. They, they want their ears tickled. They, they, they heap to themselves, to heap to themselves, teachers having itching ears. That's why this place is not filled up. That's why we're in this little place down here and not in this huge, you'll never see a huge big church. You don't, you don't want to see no huge big grace church because you can find some compromised doctrine there. I can tell you that. People don't want to hear the truth. People are going to say to you, this stuff you're telling me about Paul and this mystery, how come John Piper, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, this guy, that guy, this guy, why he don't preach that? I never heard that here. My preacher didn't say that. My father's a minister. He never did. My grandpa's a pastor. He never. Satan's devices. 
He wants to hide that truth. If you're lost, he wants to hide you from getting saved. The gospel, pure grace gospel. If you happen to get saved, he's going to keep you from knowing the mystery. Uh, let's end over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we'll end. Take some okay. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, I didn't go over these verses. You can look at them yourself. In Luke 23. The Lord Jesus was preaching in Israel, and the Pharisees were like, this guy, his words are too powerful. He's causing a ruckus. He's stirring up the people. The same is going to be said by us. For every email I get where somebody says, Brother Ron, I'm blessed by that word, rightly divided. I never heard these things, but I'm checking them out. You make me get in my word. You, you, boy, you challenging me, blah, blah, blah. You get some people steaming, man. I can see the steam coming through the email. I can see it. I can see it. I laugh, but I can see it. Religion, they mad. What do you mean? There's more than one gospel. Because there's the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24, the gospel of the kingdom, earth and heaven. The Bible says it. But see, they don't care. They attack me and us. I'm just a vessel. I say, that's in your Bible. And I always say, come on and meet with me. I'll sit down with you. But that, they never do. Here's why. Verse 26. Verse, look at verse 25. Here, here's the repentance for a believer. In meekness instructing those, that meekness, understanding that this is going to happen. Just know it's going to happen and you deal with them. In meekness instructing those that oppose who? Themselves. And then I like this one. You know what Paul is saying here? If God peradventure, perhaps, maybe, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You know what he's saying? He's saying it's up to God to determine whether they've gone so far in their unbelief that there's no turning back and they're going to suffer the judgment seat. It's up to God to determine whether he's going to let them see. See, when you reject God's truth after you hear it, God holds you accountable, and the more you reject it, the farther you go into darkness. And he's talking about, in the, in the context, those who don't rightly divide the scriptures. This is 2 Timothy 2. So let's, that's what he means. If God will give them repentance to stop in their unbelief, turn from that iniquity, as Paul would say. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And the iniquity, the crookedness is studying God in the, in the context, preaching God's word like Philemus and Hymenus, and not rightly dividing God's word. See, Okay? To the acknowledging of the what? That word acknowledge means to act upon some knowledge. So that's an action there with the repentance. Now, verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of who? The devil. Can a believer be snared by Satan? Yes. Who are taken captive by him, not at their will. They're, they don't want to be. I mean, who wants to be captive by Satan? But when you don't believe the rightly divided word and listen to Paul... Early in the chapter, consider what I say in the Lord, give the understanding of all things. Chapter 2, verse 7, you're under Satan's devices. As we come down to the end, if you're, if you're here today or if you're listening, and these things sound strange to your ears, they shouldn't. And if they do sound strange, you need to examine these things, like what we're going to see about the Bereans next time. Who go and they receive the word eager with all readiness of mind. And then, instead of saying, I ain't never heard that, I've been taught it all along, it must be right, we haven't searched the scriptures for the light, tradition's been my guide, and I'm just satisfied. I've been taught it all along this way, so this must be right, right? No, 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 no. You need to get into the word and says, that goof up there is telling me this, this, and this. Instead of getting mad, say, let me check it out. Let me check it out and see if these things are so. That's what you have to do. When you don't do that, God will let you continue on in your unbelief until there's going to be a time where he just says, Psh, you don't want it, fine. You'll suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. If you're here today and you don't know for sure whether you have eternal life as a present possession, I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. God commended and proved his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you don't know for sure you have that eternal life at this moment, you can know. Israel, they didn't have it, eternal life as a present possession. They had to endure to the end. They don't get eternal life until the kingdom, the ones who live through that.
All the ones who died in faith, they get it. But in the future, those people are going to have to endure to the end of that tribulation or to their death. Well, you and I, we can have it by faith. Christ died on, on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again. If you believe that and that alone, God forgives you all your sin, past, present, and future. He gives you eternal life as a present possession. How long is eternal? Forever. And the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He never takes it back. He doesn't change that action. And then he gives you an eternal inheritance in the heavenly places. And Brother Josh will talk more about that in the next session in the book of Ephesians. That talks about our home eternal in the heavens. Okay? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the truth of your word. That as long as we listen to the Apostle Paul, we can go anywhere in your scriptures and understand what it's saying, what you're talking about, what you're doing. As long as we understand that if we rightly divide your scriptures and, and, and allow you to speak to Israel when you're speaking to Israel and allow you to speak to the body of Christ when you're speaking to the body of Christ, we can enjoy your word. We can go into Acts and Hebrews and anywhere and enjoy your word. But we thank you for the Lord Jesus and the mystery of Christ committed to the Apostle Paul for our sakes. As we take our break, we give you thanks and praise in the name of our Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.